three hundred thousand on the phone on the to phone. a million in person in New York. A million in person to three million as a twenty-three year old. You literally had a ball out game your fr- your senior year. First, my game first game. Senior. If I don't pitch that game, or I don't pitch well, someone looks at me. They never see me again, and I just go on my my way, and I go to BYU as a as a student. I was told three times if I don't sign right now, I'll never get drafted again, and I got drafted again all three times. The time serving as a missionary, and really when you dedicate yourself to anything, I think number one, you learn a lot more because you become you're asked to be selfless. Football, soccer, golf, baseball, softball, mm-hmm. lacrosse, and that's what custom cleats answers the question: How do you play your favorite sport and your favorite shoe? Right. You come to us. I'm not out there buying crazy things except shoes. Shoes. <laughs> but those are, but those are good. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's we can justify that. We ended up putting most of our money in real estate. Okay. And that's, I think that's a good investment. Um, you need to be wise still. You can't just be careless. I mean, oh my God. These right here. I mean, the Tell them what it is. Tell them what the, it is. These for the are the podcast. Sager ones. Craig Sager, mm-hmm. Spike Lee came to a couple of games in which I pitched. Fire. And I got a chance to meet him and talk oh, to him. That's fire. He signed this baseball for me to my man, Jeremy Spike Lee. I'd love to let everybody introduce themselves, how they would like to, and then we're gonna get into all the details of everything and really break down the story. And you got a crazy collection, you got a good history, so go ahead. Cool, hey, I'm Jeremy Guthrie. I am from Ashland, Oregon. Just a youngster here from Oregon, back in my roots here in Portland. Um, I'm married, been married 22 years. I have four children, 19 all the way down to two and a half, DJ. Imagine oh, that. Wee. So we run the gamut and uh, and family. Love my kids. Love my wife. So grateful for them. Um, I was fortunate enough to play three sports in high school. I was a football, basketball, and baseball player. Okay. Baseball was the one I was given a chance to play beyond high school. Okay. I pitched. Uh, pitched collegiately at BYU and at Stanford. Okay. And then I was eventually drafted and signed by the Cleveland Indians at the time in 2002. And I began on a 15-year professional baseball career. Okay. Retired in 2017. A couple of highlights was pitching for Team USA in 2009 alongside Derek Jeter and Chipper right. Jones. And then winning the World Series in Kansas City as a member of the Royals in 2015. So, okay. Yeah. Since then, I've been uh, retired. I do a lot of traveling. I get to go out and teach baseball throughout the world. And uh, me and my my good friend from college were business partners in a business called Custom Cleats. And we just stay busy. We hustle and uh, enjoy life. But kind of that's me. That's things that I enjoy, things that are important to me. Mm-hmm. And I think another thing, too, you didn't mention, the church and all the other things yeah. you do in the community. Absolutely, yeah. Member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I've been a missionary twice, two years in Spain when I was 19 and then three more years in Houston uh, okay. from 2018 to 2021. I'm and excited. always continue to try to live your faith yeah. and you know share the goodness that is Jesus with everybody you come in contact with and, and build on common beliefs for those who maybe aren't Christians or have different beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been something that's been very important to me throughout my life as well. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about everything because, yeah, you have a lot of different elements to your life and success in different platforms, different areas. So I'm excited to hear all of it. But, you know, we always got to take it back to the OG times. <laughs> so Ashland, Oregon. I was I went to Southern Oregon. Yeah, that's why I know. threw it out there. I knew yeah, you, I knew I you went, got the, the I roots I went to Southern there. Oregon. Uh, I played college football there for a couple of years. But uh, tell me, you know, paint that picture. What was it like growing up in little Ashland, Oregon as a young grade school kid? Were, were you into sneakers? What was the family lifestyle like? Did you know about finances? Like... Where, where did everything kind of land for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was actually born in Roseburg. Okay. And I would say my love for sneakers began when I was about seven years old. Okay. My oldest brother, uh, who's eight and a half years older than me, was playing for Joe Lane Junior High School. So okay. shout out to the Joe Lane Pioneers, I think is their name. Although, forgetting already, I'm getting too old now. <laughs> forgetting details, but he was a freshman. They're red, white, and black. Okay. And their team rolled out on day one, all wearing the Chicago colorway of the of the That's Jordan crazy. one. It was insane. I'm like, that is. I'd never seen this sneaker. Right. I knew nothing about Michael Jordan probably to that moment. Okay. But I'm like, wow, where'd you get those sneakers? And they all matched, and they looked just beautiful on the mm-hmm. court. And so within a couple of weeks. You better believe that I got my first pair of uh, Air Jordan 1s. Is this the pair? No, I wish I it was were. about to say. That's crazy. Sky Jordan, though, yeah. which was dope. You know, you look at the Sky Jordan and uh, yeah. you're like, man, someday I'll be big enough to wear an Air Jordan. Wait, wait. Okay, so tell them the difference between the Sky Jordans and the Air Jordans. Well, the Sky Jordan were the GS sizes. Mm-hmm. And I have, I've talked to numerous people, as I'm sure you have, over the years. Like, how do we not retro 
in the GS size is Sky Jordan. Exactly. Like how are we rolling out Air Jordans and right. in, in all the small sizes? But that's it. I mean, as far as I know, the only difference was it said Sky Jordan. And like a little kid like me is like, well, I kind of want the Air Jordan. Right, exactly. And you had to get big enough to get an Air Jordan. Right. And I never owned an Air Jordan 1 until, geez, what, 2012, 2013 retro probably right. was the first time I ever okay. actually owned an Air Jordan Chicago colorway. But that's kind of where my love for sneakers started with my older brother uh, playing that freshman year with the Air Jordan 1. I ended up moving to Ashland, and that was a great move for my family and I. My brother and I both played quarterback for the Ashland Grizzlies, and okay. Ashland was a powerhouse in football in the 80s and 90s. Okay. At one point, this is crazy, DJ, when we were in Roseburg, the high school team went to the state championship in 1988, okay. lost to Benson. Benson? Ni 1989, my, my brother played on both these state, these state championship contending teams. Uh -huh. 89, they lost to Lake Ridge. Okay. Shout out to Mike Miotich, quarterback that dominated the the Roseburg Indians that year. 1989 was the year between my two brothers. Mm -hmm. We played in the championship again, lost to Ashland. What? Next year, my brother's a sophomore. He punts for the team, backup quarterback. They tie Tigered in the championship in 1990, 14-14. So, so they're, they're co-champions. Yes, they're running ties. In the championship? How do you do that? It was crazy. Yeah. Tiger scored with like no time left. That's crazy. And uh, the, the coach, legendary coach there, um, they met together and decided what he felt was best for his players was to get a share of the championship. Mm -hmm. And of course, no guarantee. I still got to kick the field goal, but they made it. Right. So we move in 1991 to Ashland from Roseburg, same conference. We go to Ashland. That year, they win the state championship against South Salem. Okay. My brother's a junior. Now he's a senior. They go to the state championship again. They lose to Marshfield in his senior year. They're up 21-7. He throws a what? pick six before the half, 21-14 into the half, and uh, Marshfield scores 28 unanswered Dang. and beats them. The next year is between my brother and myself. I know this gets crazy. Ashland plays North Medford in the state championship. Right. Loses to North Medford. Really? So now eight consecutive years, the city we've lived in has played in the state championship for, for football. <laughs> I get to be a sophomore. We lose in the first round. My junior, we lose in the second round. My senior, we lose, we lose in the second round. Oh. And I never get to see the championship game. <laughs> but uh, football was kind of our life. My dad played uh, college football at Southern Oregon College, as mm -hmm. it was back in the day, now Southern Oregon University. Um, my oldest brother was an all-state safety and punter. My other brother was a second team all-state quarterback. I was, I don't even know what I was. I was probably an honorable mention quarterback. Yeah. Joey Harrington was the same year as me. Okay. Uh, you know, friend of the show, friend yeah, of DJ. Yeah. Um, and so... Did y'all know each other then? No. The first time I ever met Joey was in 2002 at Stanford. He was playing in the college shriners all-star game oh, okay. okay and i had love you know i obviously knew all about at him at this time like he's big dog oh yeah, yeah. he was he was yeah, joey yeah, heisman yeah. now he wasn't joey harrington right, he was right, joey right, heisman right, right. he was the number three pick overall to the to the tiger lions that is and so i went up and introduced myself and got a chance to meet him and he had that same kind of passion that you're used to seeing when right. he does an interview like, hey, what's up that raspy voice yeah, and I was yeah, like, yeah. I was like <laughs> my buddy was like did you just talk to joey heisman how was he said he just like he is on camera like right. it was awesome right <laughs> and so um yeah, football. Was, the the point is, is football was kind of the story of my youth. I ah, played I basketball. Love I love it. I played baseball, and in basketball, I just our team was not very good. We hey, were, he could hoop a little bit, y'all. Yeah, he a little bit. A little we bit. we played together. That's right. <laughs> um, but that's kind of my life as a youngster was pretty much football, mm -hmm. and I loved it. It made me better. I think you know, young kids today, I feel like they should play all sports. Mm -hmm. Uh, being a football player definitely helped me be a better basketball player, a better teammate, a better athlete, mm -hmm. just in general. And both of those made me a better baseball player. Mm -hmm. And baseball was the career that I was able to pursue later on in life. But without what I learned in basketball and football and just the the strength I gained from doing different exercises and different yeah. you know movements, and then the camaraderie and the things you learn about being a good teammate and a, just a, a good elite athlete in mm -hmm. other sports, I think... I know without football, without basketball, I would have never played professional baseball. Okay. You're a pro baseball player. You played for 15 years. Besides that part, which hard, what sport is harder? Football, basketball, or baseball? Because there's always the great debate. I feel like some people are like, yeah. it's harder because baseball is more like a specialty sport and football is more physical and basketball is like a finesse. Da, da, da. So I want to hear like what you think. Well, it just depends. I mean, football... It's more hard to survive. It's <laughs> hard. Know? Like I, people say, do you wish you played college football? And the answer, of course, is yes. Right. You know, the idea of running out in front of 75, 100,000 fans 
is unlike really anything you experience in baseball mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, but at the same time, being six foot, I'm like, I probably would have died the first week I played college football. Like some <laughs> wait, what position did you play? I was a quarterback. Some oh, six foot yeah. five a Drew Brees guy there. running like a four two forty was gonna just clobber me and sit on me and smash me and break right. me in half. And so the more I think about college football, the more I'm kind of semi grateful that I didn't get a chance to play because mm. I still have all my limbs intact. And right. I had like no, sure. hundred concussions. And then basketball, I mean, you're just competing against the greatest athletes in the world. Mm -hmm and millions of them. Mm -hmm. And so is the sport of basketball necessarily difficult by itself? No, I mean, clearly you can be much better at the sport, Yeah, but it's not terribly difficult and you can be pretty good. And there's a ton of really good players, mm -hmm. but to be elite, to be a, a division one player and then an NBA player, uh, that's extremely difficult. Right. I think that the percentage of that happening is so low. It's like, you know, so what's more difficult Football is probably more physically challenging. Mm -hmm. Basketball is probably more statistically challenging. Like, can you make it as you compete against people from all over the world? Right, right, and right. And just the elite of the elite athletes, the people are taller than you, run faster, jump higher. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, baseball, as you said, is more specialty in some ways. But baseball is just fun. Like yeah. Baseball is American. Like, you go out there and you yeah. do it in the summertime. It's yeah. warm. That's the thing about football. Like, you don't see people just like playing football for fun. Like you can see some people going around like swinging the bat for fun or like definitely hitting the basketball court. The basketball court is the easiest thing for people to get together and go do even like unorganized, you know? So it's kind of interesting, like hearing the different perspectives when people yeah. talk about the different sports. Cause I played them all as well. And I'm like thinking about it, like, man, which one would be the one, but so, okay. Pitching during that time, you're now in high school. Okay. So, you started when did you start baseball? I started baseball like most kids, T ball age. Okay. Yep. So you were so playing the whole five, time. Five, six throughout. years old. Yeah, I played all three of them really my whole life. Okay. And then you got to high school and you still played all three sports? I did. Okay. So at what point did you like get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm good at baseball? Like I got scouts reaching out. I'm I might be going to a college now. Yeah. Super late bloomer. Okay. So I think throughout my young childhood, I could always throw the baseball hard. And I was one of those kids that generally was, you know, the top two or three hard throwers, which, you know, when you're young means everything. If you Not throw the ball really. hard, you know, people are scared of you yeah. and they can't hit you as well. Yeah. Uh, but when I got to high school, my sophomore year, I didn't pitch a whole bunch. We had upperclassmen who were, were really good pitchers. I was a third baseman and my coach didn't even want me to pitch on JV. So I just was more of a backup pitcher on varsity Okay. and maybe start a few games here and there at third base. And then junior year, I hurt my back, and so I didn't pitch very much junior year, junior year either. So what happened during that time? Like, how'd you hurt your back? And... I would just, you know, it was a weird freak accident. I don't even remember exactly. I think I was, I don't know if I was hitting or pitching, but just kind of a, you know, a tweak in mm -hmm. the lower back. And it hurt all through the summer. And my biggest concern was I was going to miss my football season because mm -hmm. I couldn't put any weight on my shoulders. I couldn't do any squats. Um, I could run, and that was about the only movement I could do. But the moment I put weight on or did sharp movements, laterally yeah, yeah, yeah. it would shoot a, a sharp pain in my back and i went to a lot of different people to try to figure out what it was it just kind of disappeared like just a lot of prayers and a lot of faith and uh, just hoping mm -hmm. that somehow like the healing hand of god would come and bless me before i could before my senior year would start mm -hmm. it, it literally happened to me mm -hmm. like one morning i woke up and i felt better and i got out of bed without pain i'm like i think it's gone and so I, you know, kind of eased into the day. And by the end, I was kind of like jumping a little bit and doing things like that otherwise would have caused a lot of pain coming down out of the air right. would always kind of shock my back and it was gone. And so, I haven't felt it since. So when you first got hurt, did you have like that? It's all over type feeling. Like, how did you No, I actually thought process? it was going to pass fast, okay. you know, because I'd never been hurt in any way before. So I just thought, oh, this is just a little back pain. No problem. And mm -hmm. that it persisted that whole junior year of baseball my spring mm -hmm. and it never went away and my bats got fewer and farther between i never pitched again the rest of the year and then i'm like okay well baseball's over so hopefully it'll go away now because i'm just going to start doing some football activity and okay. a little bit less aggressive so you're kind of more passionate about football at that time. yeah oh yeah because okay. that's what our high school is known for yeah. we were as you heard right we were in the state championship regularly mm -hmm. and we had a great coach jim nagel who was the most legendary coach uh you know for me in, in oregon high school football i'm sure there's a lot of people that combat that but um that was our that was just our school like mm -hmm. our little town of 
seventeen thousand people would just right. rally around the Ashland Grizzlies yeah, yeah, and yeah. from September until November. Like right now, we're in the thick of it, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know when sure. this will air, but it's November here in Oregon. Playoff football everywhere. Yeah, they pushed the season up early or something, didn't they? Did they really? I, I heard the championship was like way sooner than it was. Like uh, no, it's about on schedule this year. Semi, this week is semifinals. Okay. And so next week will be- I heard be, they like cut a week or something like that. No, they didn't. This okay. is exact because it was always right around Thanksgiving because okay. we were always yeah, like- we, we were always bad. Yeah, we were yeah, always we battling between, oh, we got Thanksgiving, but we also have the state championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I remember that because I was going through the same thing, playing football, and they were like having to go to winter practices and everything. And you went to- I went to Grant. Grant, that's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. It was kind of nice. We were solid. We we should have won state, but we didn't. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Who did um, you lose to? Who was your last game? Uh, we ended up losing to Jesuit. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, so good when school. I played, Jesuit still wasn't like a powerhouse. Right. They were, you know, they would make the playoffs most years, but mm -hmm. never, never really advanced super far. And then I came back in the early two thousands. That's when they sudden, started turning. All of a sudden, up. they were the they yeah. were the school, right? Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah, because I graduated two thousand ten, so I was like that 06 to two thousand ten yep. era of like athletes and sports um so yeah i was just wondering because i remember i tore my acl my sophomore year and i kind of went downhill a little bit when it came to like academics and stuff i was really focused on sports and i was like man i'm not even gonna be able to play sports and i started messing up like in school a little bit and then because i had to have the surgery do all the things with the whole process and it was just messing me up a little bit and then i had to get my mind back right and like hey once i get through the surgery and recover and all this stuff so it took me like a couple i guess i would say about half of the school year the first half of the school year just messed up my grades then i had to like recover my junior year well i think that goes a little bit back to what i i talk to kids a lot about is you know as much as i loved baseball and played baseball my entire life really even today i still play baseball i still pitch with the savannah bananas we can come back mm -hmm, to that mm -hmm. but i don't know that i ever really identified myself as a baseball or a football or a basketball player. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I was I was Jeremy, and maybe more importantly, above all, I was you know my faith taught me that I was a son of God, and that was my identity. Mm -hmm. And the things that I enjoyed doing, the talents that I had to be able to play sports or or do other things in my life, those were just parts of who I was, but they weren't they weren't me. Right. And right. so I think what you know you may have experienced, or a lot of people experience, is when the one thing that you identify as, whether right. that's a football player or a musician or whatever it might be, if that thing gets taken away from you due to injury or otherwise, yeah. then yeah, life is really hard. And there's a lot of mental anxiety and stress and mm -hmm. emotion that can go into it. And naturally, when we have stressful situations, we respond a little bit differently. And we learn <clears throat> through those experiences, as you did, like, okay, I reacted a certain way. Right. I don't want to be self-destructive. Right. You know, something that I love was taken away, but I can learn from this. Mm -hmm. And the next time I go through something hard, hopefully I don't, you know, make decisions that cause either regression or even pain or mm -hmm. mistakes. But I think that's one thing that is important to me is help athletes hopefully recognize they're more than just an athlete. For sure. And that's not to take away. That doesn't mean they're going to work less or they're not going to dedicate themselves as much to what they're doing. But it does mean that there's a balance in their life, or maybe better said, a harmony. Because mm -hmm. balance is a unique word, right? You can right. never really balance life. Like you're yeah. never going to be able to give the same amount to everything. Right. But find the harmony where you're not just sleep, eat, and the third thing. Football. There has to be some. <laughs> right, there right, has right. to be something more to you. Right. And I believe that's a really healthy lifestyle, and that will help one navigate life much better than to just identify as one particular thing, because mm -hmm. inevitably that one thing will be taken away at some point in your right, life right. and it can be really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It was, that was definitely like a little <laughs> moment for me. I was like, man, all right. I think, I guess I would say like the kind of like saddest time during high school, during that window, just cause I'm like, man, everybody gets to go out. Like I'm stuck at the house, like trying to get my knee to go 90 degrees. <laughs> like I can't even do that. You know, all the basics, yeah. like this stuff is, I had got my license. I was 16. Like I had just got my license. So I had to have surgery the next week. So I'm like, mm -hmm. can't even drive. Like, uh, just everything was just like getting taken away. It was just like, it was just bad. Yeah, that's rough. And that's, and that's every, you know, any young man, young woman that's 16 and has that taken away would, would go through the same exact right. thing you right. did. Right. Yeah. Sure. But I, I don't know. I learned a lot from it. Okay. So during this time, 
was you getting fresh in school or what? Or was you kind of still trying to figure it out when it came to sneakers and everything? Because this is like what? This for you would be in the 80s? No, this was the 90s. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mid 90s. Man, you're trying to to date me like like an 80 year old here. No, because I was thinking it would be like 89 or something like that. But that would be, yeah, 90, like two or something. Yeah, so. My earliest sneaker memories, I've already shared the first one, mm-hmm. right? Was all about the Air Jordan 1 and, and ended up getting the Sky Jordan. The next pair of J's I got was a 5. Okay. I got a black metallic 5. Okay. Um, had the pictures from Sports Illustrated put on my wall. Fire. I used to sit there and smell that kind of that glue smell on the uh, clear outsole, the first <laughs> ever clear outsole. I mean, that was... You know, I mean, if, right. you were, if you are my age and you saw the Air Jordan 5 for the first time... Right. That clear outsole just blew your mind. No, for sure. And it had a different smell. And I, I think I was licking them even before Fat Joe was licking shoes. Like, <laughs> looking like, what is this all about? And so that was my second pair. Um, and I was now in seventh grade. Okay. Those tore. And I did what every young kid back in the day, at least in Oregon, did, was what happened when your Jays tore. You uh, sent those bad yeah. boys in and yeah. you got yourself a new pair. Yeah. So my fives tore. I sent them in. I got a pair of Raptor 7s. Okay. I balled out in seventh grade in Raptor 7s, which by far are the worst basketball shoe ever made on this earth. <laughs> like, I don't know how Michael Jordan won a championship in the in the seven, but those little circles on the bottom yeah. provided zero traction. Right. I would just slide all over the court. But I was the kid that at timeouts was getting the water bottle or a towel and wiping my shoes off where people had been stepping on oh, my shoes. Oh, the top of it. Yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. If a cat stepped on my shoe in the middle of a play, like I almost would stop the play and like clean the shoe right, before right, I went back right, down. Right. So I would be cleaning my shoes and uh, and doing all that. And then I really didn't get another Jordan until the, the 11. Okay. So I went five, seven, four years off, mm-hmm. bought the 11. My last ever basketball game in high school um, I wore the uh, Concord 11. Fire. I actually wore two different pair that's of shoes. So crazy. Yeah. That's Fire. what I wore. I loved it. Went for five points and two rebounds and got beat by 40. Yeah. But I went out in style looking yeah. good. <laughs> that's so funny. I remember uh, when uh, that just made me think of the time. Remember on the football fields, it was like AstroTurf and stuff back in the oh, day? Oh, yeah. Like them terrible. Oh, yeah. You guys were playing at Civic Stadium. Yeah, and other places. like all that stuff. So. We would be playing in those different stadiums, and you would see, like, on TV, like, guys wearing, like, basketball shoes, like, in football games. Oh, yeah. I remember I wore, like, OG Bread 11s, mm-hmm. like, in one of my football games as a kid. Like, it was, like, the little championship game. That's funny thinking about that. Okay, so, you're getting into kicks. What's up with, like, money? Was, did you have a job? Was you kind of just trying to I, figure I, it out? Like, I did have a job, but not a whole bunch of time for it. So, that's why I didn't have a bunch of shoes. I think my parents bought me the fives. Okay. I flipped the fives into seven. So that was, you know, no cost to me. Right. The 11s I actually got at a value village. My my best friend, Matt, at the time <clears throat> calls me down. And he's like, hey, I'm in, I'm in Medford at the value village. And I think those those shiny Air Jordans you like so much, they're here on sale for like <laughs> 70 bucks. Yeah. I said, grab every pair there is. He's like, there's just one. I said, grab it. I'll take Guard it. it with your life. I'll be there in like 35 minutes. And it minutes. happened to be your size. It was a 12, okay. but I squeezed it in, of course. So make it work. Yep. So, so I, I ran down to the store, picked up the uh, picked up the J's. So even those were pretty inexpensive. Mm-hmm. But I was the kid, you know, my older brothers had had a couple pair of Jordans, so I would borrow them. Uh, my oldest brother had those those ones that he wore mm-hmm. in, in junior high. Mm-hmm. And so I would wear those every t- now and again. But honestly, I was the kid. The funniest part about my whole youth is as much as I like sneakers, I was the kid wearing flip flops every day to school. Yeah, my mom's from Hawaii. One of those um, guys. Papa Howley. Yeah. Like I literally just wore flip flops every single day. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would randomly shock the the little you know wearing an Air Jordan four. My brother had an OG pair of fours, mm-hmm. the OG ones. I'd wear some of the other stuff I picked up, the Elevens, but most of the time you just saw me in flip flops. Right. So t shirt, shorts, and flip flops was my skit. <laughs> all the way till the day I graduated. So okay. as much as I love sneakers, admittedly, like I was not even, I was not bringing yeah, my sneaker game. You shoes on when you got to BYU though. It's I did. It was there. cold there. <laughs> it was cold at BYU, but I was, I was not a very good representative of a sneaker head in high school. Just okay. on, the, on the court, I was decent. Off the court, I was terrible. Right, right, right. Okay. So you, uh, you got scholarship offers for just baseball? Yeah, just for baseball. Senior year? Yep. And uh, was it multiple schools or just BYU? Like, did you uh, That's a good question. So, you know, I said I didn't pitch much before. So I didn't get on the radar for baseball until my senior year. My very first game, there was a scout there to watch a teammate of mine. Okay. 
And he had had a great high school career up until that point. So they thought he was going to go, you know, maybe in the first five to 10 rounds, okay. maybe even higher, I guess. And they came to watch him and they saw me and they're like, Oh, we like this guy too. You know, I threw 92 miles an hour mm-hmm. all because of football. You know, you right. throw the football all day long, you develop a really good arm strength. Right. And so they saw me pitching and they said, well, we should watch you too. And so my interest or interest in me as a baseball player began in March of my senior year, which is really late. I mean, you tell a kid today who might be watching this, like, yeah, I didn't give, no one even knew who I was until I was right 18 years old, mm-hmm. my senior year. They would say, you got no chance to go to college, no chance to ever get drafted. Well, both happened to me. And right. so uh, last minute I was offered a scholarship to go. I was already going to go to BYU. I was now offered a scholarship to play baseball oh, that's close. in August. Okay. So yeah, I just was like, oh, here, we'll give you money. I said, well, I'm coming anyway. So August, right before the school year. August, literally like weeks before school yeah, was like, when I was is... offered a scholarship. Wow. Okay. So how did that go? Like you already packed up and like about to be ready to go out there. Yeah. Well, they just kept calling me. The the cha- the thing that was on their mind was I'd been drafted by the New York Mets. Mm. And so that whole summer, the Mets. You did? <clears throat> I was. Okay. So you got drafted by the Mets out of high school. Yeah. Okay. When I was, so three months after that whole first time that someone You literally had me. a ball out game your, fr- your senior year. First My game first game. game. If I don't pitch that game or I don't pitch well, someone looks at me. They never see me again, and I just go on my my way, and I go to BYU as a as a student. So the, that game basically kind of like changed the trajectory yeah. of everything. For oh, you. absolutely! So you had a ball out game. Now you got drafted by the Mets. How does how do you even like prepare yourself mentally for all that? You're like, yo, I'm getting drafted. I'm going to the MLB. Like, what's well, going on? You know, I think ideally I was still really focused on school, so uh-huh. that was important to me. I had a couple of goals. I wanted to be. Um, I wanted to be a valedictorian mm-hmm. of my of my class, and I was able to do that. There was eight of us who had 4.0 GPAs. Okay. And so kind of that's what I was talking about earlier, right? Like, don't just become one thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember the surprise on some of my classmates' faces when I showed up to the meeting. They call, you know, they sent us all a letter saying, hey, you're a valedictorian. Congratulations on all the hard work you've put into. Mm-hmm. We'd like to invite you to speak at graduation. We're going to invite all of our valedictorians to speak. Will you please come to a meeting? We'll talk about it. And so I remember I showed up to that meeting and the other seven students, I think maybe one of them had an idea. A good friend of mine, Jessica, she probably knew, mm-hmm. but I think the other six had no idea, right? To them, I was just, was I was just here? the guy wearing flip-flops, right. playing football, basketball, baseball, right. and acting the fool all around campus all right. the time, right? But I showed up and that was one of the more kind of fulfilling moments of my youth. Mm-hmm. I walked into that meeting and just sat down, didn't say a word. And like, you know, they're kind of chatting. They kind of looked at me as though I was in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. And I remember just sitting there, I said, I'm going to play this out. And so I sit there for a few minutes. I start asking them questions like, hey, how's everything going? What's your plans next year? You know, what are you going to do this summer Mm -hmm. after you graduate? And they kind of answer it. And then they'd kind of like go back to themselves. And I could tell they were like uncomfortable because I was there. Right. And finally, one of them, finally, one of them had the guts like, hey, Jeremy, um, like we're we're, going to have a meeting here in a couple of minutes. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. (laughs) And and I could just tell, I was like, you know, you need to get out of here. Right, right, right. <laughs> I said, I said, what's the meeting for? And they said, uh, well, it's for graduation. Um, we're going to talk about a few things that we're going to be doing at graduation ceremony. I said, that's cool. And, and so I just stayed there like, well, yeah, like this meeting is just for valedictorians. I said, perfect, man. I'm in the right spot then. Right. And they're like, what, what? You're a valedictorian? I said, yeah. You mean like straight A's? Yeah. I'm in the I'm in the right place, and I was wondering if I was in the right place. Right, and they just started kind of like shaking their head, and at that point, you know, then came the teacher, and she's like, "Okay, thanks you all for coming." Right, and she knew I belonged in that moment. Right, and so that was fun. Like yeah. that's what I remember. That's one of my highlights of high school. And it's all about not just being one thing. Try mm-hmm. to be more than. Try to be well rounded. Try to be um, engaged in everything, and recognize that everything leads to another opportunity. Like if mm-hmm. I didn't get good grades in high school, I would have never ended up as we'll talk about later on at Stanford. But because mm-hmm. I worked hard and got good grades, I was able to have a chance to pitch at one of the best universities, both academically and baseball-wise, in the entire country. Mm-hmm. And that only was a result of the hard work I put in high school and the classroom. So so you get a call, and they're like, we think you could be drafted. This is all about to happen. Like, How did the process go uh, Like with your family and everything? Your brothers had already... Been off to like college. Yeah, at brothers the time. were already in college. One was playing football right there at 
for the Raiders? Today's partner is Sneaker Throne. They have multiple options when it comes to durable and high quality display cases. One of my personal favorites is the drop side display case. I'm a size 13 and I can easily fit my shoes inside of here and I have hundreds of these stacked throughout my rooms to display my sneakers. When it comes to the cases in particular, you have four different color options, clear, black, white, and red. So if you're looking at grabbing one of these for yourself or for someone else, make sure you guys check out sneakerthrone.com and don't forget to use the discount code DNA show at checkout for 10% off of all your orders. All right, let's get back to this podcast. Okay. In Ashland, um, we were actually seniors. I think we were both seniors at the same time. Okay. And he played with Coach Helfrich. Oh, okay. Mark, who was, you know, later yeah, on, yeah, yeah. The, the head coach for the Oregon Ducks. Right. Mark and my brother actually split time. That's wild. As quarterbacks. And one would start the first half, the other would start the second half. Um, but yeah, the I, I got drafted actually while I was in English class my senior year. My dad had a cell phone back in 97, which was, you know, pretty rare that anyone had a cell right, phone. Right, right. Um, but he took, he sent me to school with it. The thing rang in the middle of English class. I walked out and a team was trying to draft me. It was the Padres. I actually said no. They said, hey, we'll sign you right now. You have to agree to a 300 and maybe 300000 or $325,000 contract. Okay. If you, if we draft you, we need a, a, an assurance that you'll sign for that. I'm like, man. Like I'm in English class right now. My English class teacher is about to kill me because I just walked out of her class with a cell phone. She's never even seen a cell phone. She's way too old to know what these things are. And somebody just like, yeah, we give me three hundred thousand. I need an answer right now. I said, my answer right now is like, no. And I click. They hung right up on me. I'm like, oh shoot. I guess I'm not playing professional baseball. What? And I walked back into class and my teacher took the phone and she actually threatened me. She's like, you know, I'm not going to give you an A. I'm, I know your goal is to be valedictorian. I'm taking that eight away. Did you tell her what, what happened? I told her. And I think, you know, she's a good friend now, a good family friend. We went to the same church. And, you know, after a few years of kind of figuring out what it was. Right. Because she had no idea. Right. Uh, no one really had any idea, really. Even Especially I, like coming out of there. Like, they're yeah. like, what's going on? So I ended up getting drafted by the Mets okay. uh, that afternoon. And they didn't call me. Same they, day. Yeah, the same day. Okay. So they actually just drafted me without telling me. The Padres, because it was a higher, it was the third round. Mm -hmm. I guess they wanted to talk to players first and get the assurances. Like, hey, if we use this pick, will it? Will you sign with us? Whereas at 15th round where I ended up getting drafted, the Mets are like, listen, at 15, we hope he signs. But if he doesn't, you know, it's not going to kill our draft. And so okay. they, didn't call, they didn't call ahead of time. They just called me and left a message like, hey, New York Mets, Jim Reeves of the the Mets. We selected you as our fifteenth pick in the draft this okay. year. We'll talk to you later and, and begin negotiating. So, did, what did they offer you? They offered me. Well, when it all came down to it, it's a great story. They flew me to New York, okay. and um, school's not over yet. Like you still got classes. No, now school's over. Okay, so the you draft graduated. happened like one week before graduation. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so now I've played my whole summer up in Washington. I played for a team called U.S. Bank in Edmonds, Washington, mm -hmm. just north of Seattle. And the Mets mm -hmm. are talking to me. BYU Baseball is now talking to me. Mm -hmm. And kind of going back to what I said earlier, like the scholarship was offered because there was an alternative on the table. So, mm -hmm. so BYU Baseball knew that if I didn't, you know, that if I was being offered a contract, maybe that would be more enticing. Mm -hmm. And so they felt like, oh, we got to offer him a good scholarship right. so that he feels like if he comes here, it's also beneficial. Right, right, right. And, you know, reality, it didn't come down to the money necessarily. Right. It was what I felt was right in my heart. And um, I had had experiences that had just let me know kind of what my path in life should be and decisions and things that should be important to me. And one of those things was being a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. of Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. And I felt that without any doubt in my mind that that I had felt a confirmation from the spirit that that's something I should do, that that right. would that would be pleasing to to God that I believe in and that it would bless people's lives and, and ultimately help me mm -hmm. in different aspects of my life. Probably not baseball, but I, like, I didn't know what it I just knew that's what was right for right, me. Right, right. And so when I flew to New York, uh, I sat there with, with Steve Phillips. He was the general manager at the time. He now works for MLB Network. And um, he knew a little bit about me and about my faith. And he asked questions like, you know, what's it going to take? You know, mm -hmm. what, what are your goals in life? What do you want to do? And we were having a conversation. And at one point he's like, well, listen, what is it going to take for you to pass up the time as a missionary that you want to do when you're 19 to mm -hmm. start your baseball career now at 18? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, and I kind of told him a story about a guy that had signed a million dollar contract a year before me mm -hmm. and had been permitted to go serve his mission. And he was in Japan at the time. His name was McKay Christensen. He was okay. out of Southern California. He was also a baller football player. Okay, dope. But I'm like... That's funny. <clears throat> Sorry, off topic real quick. I see a lot of baseball players that are like really good at either basketball or football. 
like they'd be sleepers and you yeah. go hoop with them or, or play football with them yeah like, they're but you, nice but but backwards never right like you never find yeah. like, a football player that's yeah good at right baseball. exactly exactly <laughs> or a basketball player yeah. i mean you throw the best basketball players in the world out there on a baseball field and 99 out of 100 <laughs> right. be looking terrible right yeah but i think that's true you're right but um i knew in my heart that i was being called or asked or inspired to go be a missionary and mm-hmm. so I had kind of made up my mind, like, that's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And there's no amount of money. But I told him this story about how I, this one guy did both. And I said, I would like to do both. Mm-hmm. And he kind of shook his head. And he was aware of who the player was. Like, you know, that's just not possible. We're, we're not going to be able to have you do both. Right. But I had thrown out that number a million, I guess, because he had signed for literally $1 million. Mm-hmm. And they said, go be a missionary for two years and come back to us at okay. age 21. So so the team signed him for a million dollars. Let him go. It's like, we'll see you in two years. And yes, exactly. Okay. And so I'm like, that's what I want to do. And the number doesn't have to be a million, but that's the idea. Right. And so I remember vividly Steve Phillips kind of paused and said, listen, we can't offer that deal. Mm-hmm. Like, you're a pitcher. He's an outfielder. Like, you need to choose one or the other because if you don't play baseball right now you know you're not going to get another chance to play okay and so he looked at me across the table and he says if we offered you a million dollars would you pass up the chance to be a missionary and sign a contract with us and begin your professional career okay i sat there for a minute i knew again i had that kind of confirmation in my heart and in my mind there was no price tag Mm-hmm. on passing up what i knew what i was supposed to do right and so i said i said for a million bucks i wouldn't pass it up like there's really no amount that i would pass it up i want to go to college okay and i want to go be a missionary so this all happens within like this a single year yeah months months really i go from a nobody right who wants to maybe try to walk on for football mm-hmm. to so, a somebody who's recognized to a high draft pick to a million dollar offer mm-hmm to then saying no and going to college. Okay. All so within three, four months. So uh, I'm sure you had a lot of thought and, uh, you know, and that went into that process. Um, did you have people already at BYU that you had known or were you just kind of like blindly just pulling up? Like, I'm about no, to go. No, I was blindly pulling up. I mean, my brother had gone to BYU and my dad and my mom were fantastic. Like, they never put pressure on me. They would just kind of ask what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I, I'm a parent now. Like, I don't even know how they did that because I I would be all up in my kid's dish talking like, hey, you need to be doing this or that. Right, right, that. Right, like, right. I don't know how my parents did it, but you know, credit to them. They're amazing in every way. And that mm-hmm. was just another evidence of that. But I was just doing this. I mean, I was asking for a lot of opinions and help from local leaders, mm-hmm. coaches. Mm-hmm. I talked to my coaches. I talked to teachers. I talked mm-hmm. to people from church who were really important to me. And you know, the, Obviously, the advice was all over the map. Like mm-hmm. sometimes someone would be like, "Oh, maybe this, maybe that," and more than anything, it just was more confusing. The more I, people I talked to, right, and that's why, like you know, I tell kids all the time, "Listen, you can get a lot of advice from people, right. and it's important to listen and be humble and seek advice from mentors, parents, people you respect." But at the end of the day, like you got to believe it yourself, yeah, and you got to know the answer for yourself. And whether that's you believe in a god or you believe in some other higher power or a spirit. Like if that, that's who needs to answer it for you. So for me, that definitely sounds like you learned a lot when it comes to like building a business and being organized and having a lot of things in line when it comes to that, because you lock in and you become like just the master of a craft when it comes to something like that. So what would you say you, would you got from that? Yeah, no, I think the time serving as a missionary and really when you dedicate yourself to anything, I think number one is you learn a lot more because you become, you're asked to be selfless. Mm -hmm. You're asked to put other people ahead of you Mm -hmm. and other people's interests ahead of yours. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest sacrifices of missionary service, but it doesn't, it doesn't require that you be a missionary to do that. Like each of us can work on being more selfless Mm -hmm. and thinking about other people first. And so I think that clearly is a breeding ground for learning and growing. And like you're saying, your time, my time serving as a missionary helped me in every aspect of my life. But Mm -hmm. I think Really big takeaways that I take away from from my time in Spain. Number one is I grew in my understanding of who I am and a faith and a God that I believe created me and and has a plan for me. Mm -hmm. That's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you learn a lot about organization. You set goals every single day on how you're going to 
really run your day from even 30 minute increments. We had this mm -hmm. little piece of paper we would print out and it would have every 30 minutes what we were going to do. Like we're going to go to this guy's house, but on the way we're going to stop by this person. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to 10 people on the way by just small things like that. So you learn about planning, goal mm -hmm. setting, which is extremely vital to be successful in any aspect of life. What I really feel though, I learned the most about was that I learned about success. Mm -hmm. What you do as a missionary is try to connect with people, share with them messages of, of God that you believe in mutually, mm -hmm. and try to build one another's faith. Mm -hmm. And we were always inviting people to do things like maybe come and, and read their scriptures more, or maybe pray more, uh, go to church, whatever it was. We wanted them to make decisions that would kind of ignite their faith, mm -hmm. you know, exercise faith that they could grow and learn, but it didn't always happen. Right but you wanted it to happen. And so you, I learned through service as a missionary how to better define success. Success, John Wooden says, is the peace of mind that is a direct result of the self-satisfaction that comes in knowing you've done your best to become the best you are capable of becoming. Mm -hmm. In shorter phrase, in shorter words, it's do your very best to be the best you can be and that's success, right. regardless of the outcome. And the world measures success typically by you know, championships or amount of points scored or the amount of sales made or whatever it might be, right? The number mm -hmm. of tickets sold to your concert, whatever field you might be in, mm -hmm. that's success. But success I learned was doing what I could do, the things I could control. Mm -hmm. And I could not control what people did. Everybody has their own agency or their own ability to choose. I could try to teach, I could try to inspire, but at the end of the day, it was their decision. Right. And that was huge for me because as I got home and got into baseball, I learned quickly that I could do a lot of things and I could work hard, but it didn't mean I could strike everybody out. Right. Those guys had a bat in their hand and if they were better than me and they hit a home run off me, I had looked back, did I prepare the best I could? Did I do all that I could do? Mm -hmm. And that helped me in my toughest moments. And that's perhaps one of the greatest lessons I learned that's helped me as an individual as an athlete, as a business owner, as a, as a father, as a friend, was that lesson about what success is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, learning to measure success in different ways has been a big thing for me over the past couple of years, especially like with having the channel because I'll be like making videos, just trying to get subscribers. That's what you do when you start, you know? You like want the monetary, oh, I'm gonna make X amount of dollars a month or like in it for the money type thing. And then once I started seeing the impact of like meeting people in person, and then telling me thank you for stuff i was like oh this is like why i'm making these videos like let me measure my success differently so now i don't even like care nearly as much about the views but i'm like what is the impact like what are people saying in the comment sections how is this helping people what you know i should ex i don't know if it's expect but i plan to see certain type of comments in certain types of videos knowing like this is the type of impact i want to have and this is the results i just see because of it and then that's how i can measure like my success seeing like oh when they say like oh this helped me so much or whatever or like thanks for this or oh you just helped me do whatever whatever it may be on the topic but that's kind of like how i have my new measurement now over the past couple of years when i think that kind of authenticity that you're demonstrating now is is what attracts people mm -hmm. like the other stuff will come because you're that type of person that wants to just inspire people. And mm -hmm. I see it all the time. Like I see your work and it does. You, number one, you have passion. And number two, you're trying to really give people a broad look on life, not just one thing, just not just about all sneakers only, but you're trying right. to help people recognize other things. And so that's cool that you recognized early on in, in your career. Like, listen, this isn't just about followers and this isn't just about dollars, mm -hmm. likes, follows, whatever, subscribers. It's about impact on people and people are impacted one by one. Mm -hmm. As much as we would like to impact a million people at once, if you impact just one person, that should be worth it to you. You should feel satisfied right. that you made a difference in one person's life. And rest assured, you're impacting a whole lot more than one. Mm -hmm. But really all it takes is one for it to be worth your time, my time, or anyone's time. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's just so much more satisfying too. Like, because like you said, being selfless, like when you see other people thrive off of things that you know, and you were able to teach that to somebody, not only is it that you're like becoming better at that craft, because once you can teach something, you know that you're good enough to do it. If you can teach it at a high level or teach it in multiple ways, because and basically everything in life, you have like somebody teaches somebody something, whether it's a lesson or whatever. But when you can like do that and say, hey, this is how you do it. OK, that didn't work for you. OK. I'll say it in a different way. And then this works and it like starts to stick with people. Like 
that's when you feel like confident in your own craft at the same time too. So it's, it's fun, like making different videos and everything like that. Yeah, Amen to that. So, okay. You come back to the States. You, what you doing? You haven't played ball yet? Like what's going yeah, on? Yeah. So I got a really awesome opportunity because of my, my dad and my high school coach, mm -hmm. they had reached out to Stanford university who had just lost in the championship game in the college world series okay. to LSU. But they're like, listen, give, give this, give my son, give this player, this player of mine, a chance to come pitch for you. Mm -hmm. And so when I got home, I suddenly had this choice. Am I going to go back to BYU and pitch? Or am I going to go to Stanford? And I think deep down inside, I knew what I wanted to do. And that was to go to Stanford, mm -hmm. but I went and visited both schools. I met the new coach at BYU since, since I had left, met the coach at Stanford. And it was new. I knew within minutes where I was supposed to be. And mm -hmm. so I transferred uh, to go to school at Stanford, not knowing what I had in the tank. Was that your first time like being down there in Cali? Um, in California, no, but in that Bay Area right yeah. there, yeah. I mean, okay. it, by the way, if you've ever been to Stanford, it's amazing. Well, so I went to Foothill, like which is like oh, yeah. right outside of San Jose. Oh, of course. So like, I, yeah, I've been around there. It's cool. Yeah, I like it. it's an amazing <laughs> place. Uh, so yeah, you get there and you're like, this is the place. I yeah, want to yeah, be yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. This weather's unbelievable. Yep. The baseball field was unbelievable. The program was incredible. And so I didn't know what I had in the tank, right? And I don't think they knew either. They just talked to scouts who had seen me three years previous, like, hey, yeah, the guy was good back in 1997. Mm -hmm. We're now in 2000, but give him a chance. Right. And so they did, uh, thankfully. And I got back, started hitting the weights as soon as I got home. I started running. I started playing catch for the first mm -hmm. time in 22 months. Sheesh. And within just a couple of months, like, you know, nothing because of me. Just whatever reason, like all of a sudden blessings came down and I was able to throw the ball as hard, if not harder. Mm -hmm. I remember the coaches one day said, hey, what pitches do you throw? I'm like, Honestly, like a fastball. Beyond that, like I got nothing. I got nothing for you. Like I threw some other pitches three years ago, but they were garbage. Right. And so they said, try your curveball like this. Try your slider like this. Try your changeup like that. I threw all three of them. They mm -hmm. were all unbelievable. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, use those pitches. I'm like, perfect. And so here I am, fresh off of two years being gone. I'm on a top 10 team in the country. Mm -hmm. and I'm pitching well enough to be named a starter. I become the Friday starter over the next two years. I'm an All-American twice. I'm a finalist for the Golden Spikes Award, which mm -hmm. is the, the baseball Heisman Award, if you will. Mm -hmm. We play in the College World Series both years. We lose to Miami in the championship in 01. We lose to Texas in the semifinals in 02. Mm -hmm. And after all of that, I get a great education. I meet incredible teammates and friends, many of which are doing amazing things right now. One of my teammates, Sam Fold, is the GM of the Philadelphia Phillies. Mm -hmm. Ryan Garko is a farm director for the Detroit Tigers right now. Okay. I'm probably forgetting others, but guys that have done big things. Carlos Quinton was an all-star in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. These are teammates I had and other guys that are making this big, big impacts. Jed Lowry played. Well, I didn't play with Jed, but he came after me and he's from Oregon. Mm -hmm. So just incredible people. But um, where was I going with that? That eventually I just had this chance to be with all these great guys and to be able to, you know, get an education. And after all of that, I get drafted in the first round by Cleveland in 2002. Mm -hmm. So now that's five years after I was originally drafted by the New York Mets in 1997. So you went from like 300,000 <laughs> offer. 300,000 on the phone. On the to phone. To a million in person in New York. A million in person. To 3 million as a 23-year-old. And I just tell kids all the time, listen, whatever someone in baseball tells you you can or can't do, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Like only you know what you can accomplish mm -hmm. if you have your priorities straight. I was told three times, if I don't sign right now, I'll never get drafted again. Mm -hmm. And I got drafted again all three times. <laughs> and so granted, it's not the normal path. Right. It's the road less taken, the right. one I chose. But, you know, if you're good at something, if you have a passion for something mm -hmm. and if it's you know, if it's God's will for you mm -hmm. and you put him first, rest assured, I believe without a doubt that the right thing in your life will happen. Mm -hmm. And and I'm grateful it did. And I don't think the story ends the same way for everybody that puts certain things first in their life, mm -hmm. but I know it can. Mm -hmm. And so that hope, that experience I had is what I share with, with people all the time and uh, sign the contract in 02 and, and move on. But that's that was kind of how the whole returning back from spain translated into a professional career so again this is like in months yeah 
Like, yeah. just like it was before, same thing again. Everything is just kind of fast. It's miracles. The day of miracles has not ceased. Right. Like you can see a miracle in your life every single day. Right. I think more importantly, you can be the miracle in mm-hmm. someone's life. And so, you know, don't d- dare to dream big, dare to follow what you know is right mm-hmm. and just trust in what, ha- when what happens. So, okay. You got back. What, what's up with the shoes though? You still rocking kicks? Oh yeah, you the still, shoes. Wait, uh, forgot about the shoes. Um, <laughs> funny you ask. When I got back to, to Oregon or back to the United States, better said, I ended up transferring to Stanford. I don't think I really picked up a shoe for about a year. I mm-hmm. wasn't thinking about shoes so much. I was now dedicated. I was had a ton of homework mm-hmm. and I'm dating my my soon-to-be wife and I'm trying to catch up in baseball. Okay. But I do oh, remember- did you, Oh, yeah. Did you guys meet at Stanford? We met at BYU. BYU. Yeah. Oh, so okay. we wrote okay. letters for two years. Okay. And then when I got back, we dated for another year. Oh, she's year. a real one. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. She's absolutely. a real one. Jenny's the- the real deal in every sense. If you know her, you know she's my better three quarters. And so um, it's amazing. I was at the mall, Stanford Mall, Athlete's Foot. And I walk into a store and just, oh, I'll go check out the sneaker scene right now. And I think it was early 2002. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about for you, but when I was in high school, one of the shoes I dreamed of having was the Air Force, the Air Max Force, mm-hmm. the Barkley shoe that he mm-hmm. wore in the finals and that the Fab Five wore. And mm-hmm. Probably put on the map more mm-hmm. even than Barkley, if that's possible. And I had never had the shoe. My buddy's, uh, my buddy's brother had the shoe in high school, and I tried to buy it from him. But I walk in the store, and boom, perfect retro of this Air Max. This is when it was way easier to cop oh, shoes. Oh, so in the easy! Day. I walked right in and said, "I gotta have that shoe." I bought it. To this day, I still have never worn it. Really? It's like a trophy to me. Like it was so nice. I should have bought like two pair. What? But um, you still got it though. I got it. I got other ones I I wear. But that exact one, yeah. I didn't. I never wore that one. That's and fire. So it's the uh, that was the first sneaker I bought after, geez, almost probably like a three and a half year hiatus. Because even the year at BYU, I didn't buy any sneakers. I was That's just wild. busy with life and school. Right. But I bought that shoe and I was so happy. Isn't it so funny how like a shoe like that, like some people would be like, "What is this? Who oh, cares?" Geez. Right. But like you can have all these samples and PEs and crazy rare limited shoes and be like, but you see that one and you're like. Ah, like this that is shoe a- cha- that shoe changed the world. If you don't believe us, just go watch the Fab Five right, documentary, the right. ESPN films Fab Five. Mm-hmm. Like that movie, I still watch that movie once a month. It just gets, <laughs> it just gets me going. Like seeing those interviews from Jimmy King. It's like and, I feel a little low. I need to watch Rose. the Fab Five. <laughs> Man, I I just I, I when you, when Jimmy King, I think it's Jimmy, is telling the story about how he has his hand on the heart of Chris Webber mm-hmm. right there in the championship game in New Orleans at the Superdome. Right after he's called the timeout, he's you know it's silent, and I can just feel his heart beating. Right, his right, chest. right, right, right. And just trying to console him, he says, you know, at that point, it wasn't about winning championships. Is what Jalen Rose said. It was about helping out a brother. Mm-hmm. You know, a brother who was in pain. Like that. That film just gets me all kind of emotional, yeah. and it really teaches me what sport is all about mm-hmm. and the impact that an athlete can have. I mean, those five guys, mm-hmm. and the credit of Coach Fisher. Um, Coach Dutcher, like those dudes changed. I feel like they changed the world. And so, yeah, like yeah. Those those yeah. five people, those five athletes, literally changed the game. So yeah. that sneaker is more than just a sneaker. That sneaker for me is is cultural. It is evolutionary. It's it's everything. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, it looks amazing. No, nah, for it's sure. Great design. For sure. So <laughs> I don't even know who designed it. I probably should know who designed that shoe, but it's amazing. <laughs> okay, so you go to Cleveland. Mm-hmm. So you you. What what's up like at at the time girlfriend is she coming with you like now we're you going by yourself by the time I got drafted and signed okay we're married now okay yep, so we got, got married. married right after the college world series in two thousand and one so okay uh, this upcoming year we will celebrate twenty three years fire that's an Congrats. important anniversary right twenty three yeah twenty three is big in all in all aspects yeah. of life and uh, we're now married and baseball career begins in two thousand and two it starts in in Winter Haven Florida. It's a grind. Like people, you know, young players say, oh, I want to play professional baseball. Like, good for you. But like, mm-hmm. it's not easy. Right. You go to these it's small little games, towns right. and a lot of games. And you're with people from all over the world with different cultures and mm-hmm. languages. And, um, you know, you're just thrown into the fire. And on top of that, you're competing for the same jobs. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's very much a dog eat dog world. The five guys next to you, the 10 pitchers on your team all want the same job in the big leagues that you want. Right, and right, so right. Uh, it's a grind. My first four years were very, very up and down. Um, some really good highlights and some really, really tough lowlights mm-hmm. to the point where I think every player 
in his first couple of years probably thinks about quitting. I was no different. Like mm -hmm. this is, you know, is this worth it? The emotional stress, right, the, right, right. the time away, the grind and just getting beat up mentally and emotionally all the time. But uh, Major League Baseball, like any sport, it weeds out the the ones that aren't going to make it and mm -hmm. hopefully the cream rises to the top. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my experience. And I really was, I was in the minor leagues for the better part of four seasons before I ever really made it to the big leagues. Okay. So that's all I was about to ask you. Minor leagues, big leagues, all the different parts. I understand football, contracts and everything. How does that work? Like you said, so you got drafted in the first round. It's a $3 million contract. How does that go? Like X amount of years, you start in a smaller team and you work way up. Like yeah. how's it all go? For for ninety nine percent of players, you sign a you sign a get a bonus when you sign to play baseball. Okay, and you are under the control of that team for about six years. Oh, okay. Yep, where they can do whatever they want with you. They can demote you, promote you. Okay. Um, and then when you get to the major leagues, there's six more years that you're in control of the team. Okay. And so you know, in reality, a team can control you for around ten to twelve years without you having any say where you go. So you could get $3 million and never play like in the major leagues. Oh yeah. Oh geez. Definitely. And there's, okay. there's a lot of us out there that that's the case, you know, okay. you given a big signing bonus and you never once make it to the big leagues, but there is, there is rookie ball. There is a ball, double a ball and triple a ball. And okay. you have to get through all those levels to get to the big leagues. Okay. And then once you get to the big leagues, you got to stick. Right. You got to perform well enough because it's much easier, right, than it is in football. There's nowhere really to send anywhere other than practice squad mm -hmm, or something. Mm -hmm. In baseball, if you're not good enough for a week or two, they just send you back to the minor leagues. And then they call someone else up. And if that guy plays well, guess what? You may have missed your chance. Right. At least with that team in that moment. And so uh baseball is really a grind that way. And okay. the difference is, you know, the guys you see playing in the final four and and on Saturdays in college football are the ones you're going to see playing in the NFL. Mm -hmm. They're going to get drafted and the first rounders are probably going to start or they're right. going to be right there in the cusp of starting. Yeah. Whereas the best players in, in college baseball are going right to the minor leagues and some of them will be there for a lot of years before you ever see them. Really? Yep. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. So how does the, how does the pay structure work for that? Cause I know like they switched it even with the NFL. How they go like the weekly and you could do like a whole year now and get paid every month. Like... No, baseball, you get paid uh, bi-weekly, so twice a month. Okay. And pay has gone up in the past few years. There's been a lot of great baseball players and others who have fought for better pay for minor league players. Okay, Because okay. in the old days when I, you know, a minor league player could make as little as 850 bucks a month. Jeez. Which is well below, you know. That's like arena like, football. Well, it's even like, it's like lower than if you just went to any job and got paid by the hour. Right. Because in right. theory, you're at the baseball field every single day from one o'clock until 11 p.m. Yeah. So you're working 10 hour days. And you can't even. Times 30. Have time to work another job. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're getting paid well below even minimum wage at times. You have to rely on that bonus that you got, which for some players is a few thousand bucks. Others, it's a few million bucks. So, okay. So that's at the beginning. Yep. You get a bonus. Okay. The bonus is just a bonus. Like okay. It's not really a contract. It's okay. just a bonus. And then you get minor league pay. I don't know what the minor league pay is today, but it's much better than what it was when I played. Okay. And, um, and really the real money comes in the big leagues. You know, gotcha. the big league minimum is $750,000, I think this year. Okay. Uh, the average salary is probably in that two to $4 million range. So okay. once you make it to the big leagues, yeah, you get compensated well. Gotcha. But until then, you okay. know, you are more or less kind of fighting for a better life. So how many, you said you did four years before you got to four the Four years leagues? in the minor leagues. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then I broke in with the Baltimore Orioles in 2007 and pitched okay. five years with the Orioles. Okay. Had a great time there. I love Baltimore. The The fans there are amazing. One of the best stadiums in all of Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. Incredible teammates. We were not a good team. We lost, uh, about yeah. nine, we were about 60 and 90 almost every single year, but it was a chance for me to make it into the major leagues, establish myself as a, you know, as a pitcher in the big leagues. And um, I'm super grateful that the Baltimore Orioles was my second team, saw me as a pitcher that could help in the major leagues and mm -hmm. gave me that opportunity. So, okay. So mm -hmm. when you got that chance, what was, what was like the new deal? What was the new contract? Well, I was released by the Indians okay. after four years. And so um, I was picked up by the Orioles I needed to make the major league team. If I did, I okay. was going to make a good minor major league salary. Okay. 
if I didn't, I was going to be stuck in the minor leagues again. Gotcha. And so fortunately enough, I pitched well in spring training. They awarded me with the 25th roster spot, which is the last one. There's only 25 okay. on the roster at those okay, times. Okay. I got the last roster spot. And uh, from there, pitched well and earned my earned my spot on the team for those next five years before I was traded to my next team. Got you. Okay. So you were there for five years. Yeah. Five seasons. Baltimore. Oh, seven through 2011. Um, Baltimore. Yeah. It's a great spot. Okay. So the whole family is moving around as yep. everything is going. Yeah, exactly. Family's we getting we bigger lived in at the Buffalo, same time. New York. We lived in Akron, Ohio. We had my first. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I had a quick question. Are you guys interested in taking your shoe game to another level, but you just don't know where to start? I built a full program just for somebody like you, the Six Figure Sneakerhead. It's an eight-week program that takes you through all the steps that you need to know. We have a full community where you can engage with everybody else that's going through the same program as you. We have monthly live meetups where you can connect with me and other members on the inside, and we set goals for each other and held each other accountable. Also, we give away a free pair shoes every single month with different challenges. If this is something that's for you or you're looking to take your game to the next level or even flip your sneakers to turn that into real estate, this is the place where you need to be. I can help you with finding loans and remodeling properties and getting yourself on the right path to become a millionaire if that's something that you desire. If this sounds like something for you, hit the link down below in the description and get signed up today. This is more than just sneakers. I want to see people grow and succeed in all aspects of life. Let's get back to the podcast. Uh, child Avery, our daughter, when we were in spring training in Central Florida back okay. in 2004. Okay. Uh, our second son was born in the off season of 2006. And so he spent most of his life with the Orioles. Mm -hmm. And then our third child was born in Baltimore mid season. I actually delivered him mm -hmm. uh, after a game, you know, Duh. went into the, ho into the hospital and, he, and my wife was induced. And then our fourth child was born after I was retired. So, okay. Yeah. Got you. So um, what was I going to ask you? I just started thinking about the just being a, a father and a, a athlete, a pro athlete mm -hmm. with multiple children. That just made my mind run in another place. Um, I guess you could talk about that more too. How did you go? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got the question now, but I asked you about the kids. So how did you balance being a father in, in a – and playing professionally, you know, worrying about your craft, but also still worrying about your family and everything. Because you could easily, you could put them to the side and just worry about sports. Or you could diminish your sports and worry about your family more and then lose your contract. And then now you got to go find something else to do. Yeah, everyone does it a little bit different. It's, it's extremely challenging because your job is every single day for six months. Mm -hmm. um, what is unique about baseball is you have most of the day at home mm -hmm. when you're there. So I would be with my kids until two in the afternoon. Then I would go to the field. So you had to, you know, things I did well, sometimes other times I didn't do well is you, you need to invest the time that you are there mm -hmm. in being present. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the big keys, no matter what you do as a father or as a, as a friend is try to be present when you're there. And like I said, for me, that's still something I'm trying to learn how to do. Mm -hmm how to be there, not on a screen, not distracted by all the other millions of things that can <laughs> take yeah. your time and energy away. Um, but that was one of my focuses, trying to do that. And then you try to engage and, and allow them to have the experiences with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think today kids are way are welcome to the field all the time. It was a little bit different as I was going, but okay. you know, I see players today have their kids at the stadium all the time, all afternoon. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I pick and chose my moments to do that. But overall... Um, if you're just aware of your family and try to make time for them and be present, I think that's the biggest key that I would ever share with anyone and something I hope to do better myself, even still today. Mm -hmm. Cause just cause I don't play baseball doesn't mean I don't have a lot of things going on and can still be distracted. And right. so you got to really think about what am I doing? Am I there with them? Am I talking to them and listening to them and mm -hmm. not just like, you know, doing my own thing. Right. Okay. So the, uh, other part is like you said, young receive a lot of money. How did you get your crash course on what to do with the money? What to, you know, because everybody always has their opinions. Everybody can tell you what to do. But at the same time, it's like, you got to listen to it. But then you got to make your yeah. own decision. Like, bro, you ain't even making this type of money. So I can't listen to everything you're telling me. Like, you know what I'm saying? So how did you go about that? And what were some your uh, good decisions that you made? And what are some bad decisions that you made? I think number one is you got to surround yourself with good people. And I had a lot of good veterans around you that, that would talk about things like, how do you use your money? Where's a good investment? Where's not a good mm -hmm. investment to be, to be aware of. 
And I think when you when you first start in professional sports or when you have a big kind of windfall of money in your life, if it's through some other avenue, uh, you're going to have a lot of people that approach you. And mm-hmm. they're going to say, hey, do this, do that. Let me take your money. Let me manage right, it. Right, right, right. Um, I think what I, you have to find what's most comfortable for you. I found what was most comfortable for me and my wife was real estate. We mm-hmm. really appreciated the fact that if you bought real estate, you could touch it, you could feel it. Mm -hmm. I could even understand it. I understood like, okay, rent cost me $1,400 a month to rent an apartment. A house is 2000. I can understand that. Okay. If I buy a house for 200 grand and I rent it for 2000 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the home increases in value over time, Right, like that pencils for me. Mm -hmm. And so I made a few investments with uh, some money managers that I just didn't like. I didn't understand what was going on. They I'm not the a, big fan of yeah, it. Yeah, I didn't like, love it either. They yeah. spoke a different language and talked about this and this and that. And well, this, you can't really see it right now, but eventually it's going to be worth a lot. And I'm like, how much are they making how off much? of my money? Correct. To tell me like, oh yeah, we're going to get you that 7% or whatever. And I'm like, okay, but what are you like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, let me see the whole breakdown. So I didn't love that. So I, I ended up, we ended up putting most of our money in real estate. Okay. And that's, I think that's a good investment. Um, you need to be wise still. You can't just be careless. Mm-hmm. But um, that's that's where we chose to park money that I earned from day one all the way until now. And it, you know, pays us something monthly that we can live off of. So it's, it's just a really good, safe investment. Is it a like single family, multi-unit, multiple bit of options? Both. Yeah, like, a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. What do you think is your favorite out of all that? And are you in like different cities and states and everything? Most or of it, it is kinda... done in Utah because okay. that's where we lived at the time and have great business partners that helped me find opportunities that made sense at the time when we purchased them. So um, all of our doors are there with the exception of one or two. Okay. And, you know, just, it, it's real straightforward. Mm-hmm. Like if you have a air conditioner that blows out, it's going to cost you a couple grand right, right, right. to fix it. Yeah. But aside from that, you know, you, you know, we, we know what we're going to get every month. We can budget it. Mm-hmm. It provides kind of a safe, consistent pay for us to live off of. And um, on top of that, you know, the thing you forget about is you just think about the money it's spitting out every month. But on top of that, the property itself mm-hmm. is increasing in value, right? Mm-hmm. Imagine something I bought 20 years ago probably has a significantly right, higher right. value. And I don't even think about that part. All I think about yeah. is the the monthly income that comes right. from it. Like cash flow. Yeah, the cash yeah. flow. But now all of a sudden, oh, on top of that, geez, the property is actually worth double. Right, right. So I like that. That to that. me makes sense. I can understand it. When problems go, I understand the problems. And the problems are, listen, we had a big issue with the, with the apartment. We have to empty someone out for a couple months until we fix the carpet. Like that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Whereas when stocks go down and up, it's because one person said one thing, right, right, one right. report wasn't great. Like, I don't get why that makes you lose all this money really quickly. Mm-hmm. And so that's just where I'm safe. I know the stock market, you know, provides a lot of wealth for a lot of people and a lot of stability, but I like to sleep well at night and I sleep a lot better when I understand what's going on. I feel that. So those are some good things. What are some of the hurdles or mistakes that you might have had when it comes to money management or investing or whatever it may have been well, over the years. Yeah, you know, by by nature I'm pretty I'm pretty cautious with my money. Okay. Uh, I'm not out there buying crazy things except shoes. Shoes. <laughs> but those are but those are good. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> what we can wife, justify that. My wife always says that you you're always buying this and you're buying these shoes and that shoe has that but at the end of the day, if we ever need to sell them or get rid of them. Right. They're all worth way more than we paid. Right. Yeah, but you'll never sell them, which is probably true. Like you never sell them. I said, but, but it's an option. But it's an option. Exactly. Like I'm not buying some Gucci shoe that anyone can buy for 500 bucks and then just breaking it and throwing it away. At the right. End. Like right. this 500 dollars shoe might be worth 1500 down the road. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think just naturally, I I wasn't inclined to blow all my money. But I think if you're a young athlete, like treat yourself like mm-hmm. identify what you want to get but don't just be crazy like don't go from someone that you know lived pretty normal and humbly for a lot of years to getting a little bit of a contract and now everything you own is gucci louis vuitton and your car you're getting a new car every two or three years and mm-hmm. you're buying a brand new range rover and a brand new porsche or whatever else mercedes like you need to i think you just need to recognize that especially as an athlete mm-hmm. but no matter what field you're in your earning lifetime is not super long. So right. you might be making three, four, five, maybe even $10 million. Like you might only be doing that for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. The dudes that build, you know, the people that build a ton of wealth are the ones that are CEOs and presidents and have, a, you know, earn that two, $3 million every single year for mm-hmm. 50, 60 years. Mm-hmm. Athletes have a really short window to earn. And so um, 
you know, I think it's wiser to temper what you spend early on, mm -hmm. make it through your career, and then see what you got. Right. And how are those investments working for you? And then find a budget and say, okay, now I know what I'm really making. Mm -hmm. And I know I can afford to go buy this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. But I think just to think that that kind of money is going to pour in for the next 20 years of your life as a young athlete, when you get that million dollar, or two million, $10 million contract, you put yourself in a really risky situation. And then additionally, you got to be cautious with where you how you spend your money and how you spread it around. Mm -hmm. you know, if you have a big family or just a group of friends, like yeah. that can get real haywire real quickly. Yeah, you know, I was about to say. Just go watch some, some I, 30 for 30s, right? I hear uh, a lot of people of different levels of success monetarily talk about, it's not like survivor's remorse or whatever they call it, but it's essentially like I made it and I feel like I'm obligated to bring people along with me. Yeah. So I need to cover this, pay for that, help them out for this. And then the list gets bigger and the people do this and the things get longer. Like, you and know, that's classic, a great, like, it's a great thing that they want to help. Right. But to be able to do, to help people for the long term is more valuable than to help them just in the short term. Right. And if you blow it all and you end up with nothing left, you know, what can you do later on to help people? Right. Because you hear the classic like, oh, I'm about to go to the league. I'm about to buy my own house. I'm about to get a car. Like, yeah. that's always the thing. And then like all the homies and all the stuff. It's not, again, like they've been a part of your, your journey too. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like kind of hard to. <laughs> and, and I'm less concerned about kind of those big one-time purchases. It's when your entire identity mm -hmm. and how you operate mm -hmm. completely flips on its head, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you want to pay off your parents' mortgage as a thank you. And you spend two hundred fifty grand or whatever it is. That's a really expensive one-time expenditure, mm -hmm. but that's a lot better or a lot more manageable than when you just be like, "I'm just going to buy everything now. I'm going to buy cars for everyone, and I'm going to buy cars for right, myself." Right. And you kind of have this consistent leakage from your financials mm -hmm. going into stuff that's really wasteful. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what it's more about for me is like <clears throat> recognizing, yeah. A couple of one-time purchases are good, but otherwise I need to live within reason, mm -hmm. within my means, and kind of figure out what I have mm -hmm. even after the career is over. I love, okay, too. Just talk about, like you said, identity and all those other things. You have the ability to, in the right spaces, people, oh, yeah, glorify you, all those things, right? But you can, like, just go to the grocery store and nobody can know who you are. Yeah. And, like, be in this place where it's like, I'm having success. I built my wealth. I'm doing my thing. I'm taking care of my family. I had a great career, but I could just be a regular person. Like, what does that feel like from your side? That's one of the great blessings, you know, being a, a non-superstar like myself. You can live that way, right? Yeah. You can you can have a good career, but but at the same time, I'm not some mega star. So I appreciate that. It's nice to be able to to live your life. I can only imagine for the mega stars mm -hmm. the difference, right? Like right. the quality of life, to be able to go out and do whatever you want, whenever you want, and not always have this expectation that you're a, a high roller, big baller, right. and or that you have to get, you know, suffocated by fans who want photos and pictures. Mm -hmm. um, I think I appreciate that. So it's nice to be here, just a humble kid living here in Oregon, and mm -hmm. and get to live just like everyone else. Right. Even though I've had some really cool experiences and some really unique opportunities mm -hmm. in my life. Okay, so with that, I, I don't want to say the custom cleats was your first business, but. You, that's a newer business that you got going on right now. Yeah. Uh, so you're into shoes, play baseball. You make baseball cleats turned into shoes. Well, that's yeah, that's how it all started, so, right? I remember, I want in or my early in my career, there was only a few Jordan athletes: Derek right. Jeter, right. Andrew Jones, maybe another one. I'm CC. forgetting. CC was even a little like, bit later. Yeah, yeah he even was later. a little bit later himself. Yeah. But I'm like, man, I want to pitch in some J's. Right. And so I tell my agent, how do I pitch in Jordans? And they do some homework. Like, hey, there's a company here in New York that will put cleats on the bottom of any shoe. Mm -hmm. I'm like, done. Let's right. do it. And so my first pair of Jordan cleats was a pair of uh, Jordan 1 Max Orange and okay. Black. Okay. And I wore them with the Orioles. I'm like, this is dope. I'm, an, I'm like a Jordan athlete. So this is like a long time ago. Yeah, I think it was just 2008 or nine. Okay. And then I did a few more pairs over my career and got to know Anthony, the owner of Custom Cleats. Okay. And so at one point he said, hey, listen, you're a guy that I see as uh, you know, involved in the sneaker world, a sneakerhead. You understand shoes and the way what makes people kind of what kind of makes people go. Mm -hmm. You know, would you want to be a part owner of the company? And so I invested and bought 25% of the company okay. back in 2015. And then just this past year, my good, my good friend and business partner is like, hey, let's do this together. 
And so we bought custom cleats in April of 2023. Now we run okay. it. I, I own it. We own it together hundred mm-hmm. percent. We're running the business and trying to just figure out ways to get, you know, more of what, what athletes want and what does an athlete want? They want their favorite shoe because of color or feel or both. Mm-hmm. And they want to be able to wear it on any sport, mm-hmm. football, soccer, golf, baseball, softball, mm-hmm. lacrosse. And that's what custom cleats answers the question. How do you play your favorite sport and your favorite shoe? Right. You come to us. And, okay. Uh, that's what we do. You know, so we got all kinds of athletes that are wearing shoes with, with cleats. And I brought a pair. I should show you a couple that I really like. Yeah. These are, um, some trainer here, the Bo Jackson broken bats, which are fun. Cause they, you know, if you look, no, I used to era, have those. I used to have yeah, those. Yeah, you're yeah. from my area, you know, Nintendo, Fire. you yeah. know, Nintendo, but yep. what you do is we carve out a little bit of the bottom of the shoe. Uh-huh. And then we have a special glue that's been developed over a lot of years and doing a lot of homework. And we attach the bottom to the also, shoe. Also, you don't have to drill through the nope. bottom. Okay. Nope, we don't got to drill through anything. The shoe feels exactly like it did before, but now it's got traction. Fire. Yep. So that's that's uh, our business model. We do all different sports. I brought the Vans because we, we have a pitcher, Michael Lorenzen, who's been wearing custom cleats now for five, six years. Wearing the Vans? Yes. That's who, oh, He wears the Vans. Yeah. And this year, he threw a no-hitter in a pair of uh, EXO Ultra Range Vans. Really? And they're in the Hall of Fame. And so Michael Lorenzen, because of his accomplishments, has helped Vans and custom cleats arrive to the Hall of Fame. The place I'll never get. I'll never get there on my own. But because of Michael like, Lorenzen. He's got there. But because of Michael Lorenzen, the company's there, which is really kind of cool. That's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so... um. I mean, this is essentially for all levels of sport, oh, all levels of athlete. When we bought the company, we yeah. asked we asked Anthony, the uh, the original owner who continues to work for us. Anthony is an absolute artist in his craft. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. We said, who are the majority of our, our customers? And he said, you know, a lot of high school kids, mm-hmm. college kids, some adults, especially ones that play golf and or softball. We've been most surprised with the amount of youth customers we have. Interesting. And I feel like a third of our orders come from kids that are ordering in that size one Y to six Y. Mm-hmm. And we charge only 150 bucks for youth conversions. Okay. Um, dude, kids, parents are buying all kinds of incredible kicks for I their bet. kids. And they're left and right. We get orders every single day from little ballers. Uh, majority of them play baseball. But geez, we got some fun, fun shoes for kids that are really killing it out there across the country. So what's the plans uh, with the business moving forward? And now, like, essentially, that, that's what I'm saying. Is this like the first like business that you're like dealing with that you want to grow? That you oh, most scale, certainly. That yeah, wanna... this is definitely the first business I've ever been involved in uh, directly, right? Mm-hmm. Where I'm in charge and we're reaping the benefits and or suffering the consequences of yeah, bad yeah, decisions. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, we're learning together. Neither of us, I didn't go to school for business. I, right. I studied sociology. Mm-hmm. So you learn different aspects of it. And my dad was a business owner. And so I'm talking to him and learning a little bit from him. Mm-hmm. But it's just exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a great company. I don't think it's going anywhere. We have all kinds of athletes. The more they find out about us, the more they share the word. And that's what we're trying to do is just right. grow it that way first and foremost. But we have different strategies we've been trying to use and mm-hmm. doing different things that we haven't done before in the past. And uh, it's fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. What is your uh, what's your take on like TikTok and all other different stuff? We're trying to learn TikTok. Like I don't speak TikTok very well. <laughs> we have a page for Instagram yeah. uh, for uh, for custom cleats. That is okay. We have a few posts. You can check us out. It's at custom cleats. Yeah, I'm gonna link everything underneath. Yeah, it's the at video. custom cleats. That's the same for our Instagram where we do 95 percent of our work. We have a Twitter as well. I'll admit I'm not paying as much attention to the Twitter. Okay. Um, we need to get better at TikTok. That we know that's a an untapped potential Man. for us. We just need to find. I wonder if it's like a challenge or like some type of. I don't know, like some type of creative, showing before and after type thing. Yeah. In a quick series. Anna Bruni, she plays professional softball. Okay. For a, a team down in Texas, the Smoke. Okay. And she's an incredible athlete, center fielder, slap hitter, super fast. She reached out to us. We we partnered with her. And okay. she got the she has the TikTok thing down really good Perfect. as well as the Instagrams. So we're like, you know what? If we don't know how to do it, let's find someone who mm-hmm. does. And mm-hmm. so she's been an awesome spokesperson for us. Or we're just getting started together. Big things are gonna happen with, uh, with what she does and what the company can do. Fire. Okay. So uh what's uh what's it been like on the collection side? Collection side, you know, I'm just 
what started off as completely Air Jordan, Air Jordan, Air Jordan mm -hmm. has kind of evolved over the years. But like right now, I'm just super hyped on Kobe 6s, which is cool because now yeah. they're going to start releasing them again. Yeah, yeah. But I'm all about the PEs. Like PJ Tucker, I got his four pair that he did for the Yeezy 2. Okay. Uh, you know, he did the the Cheetah, mm -hmm. the Red Octobers, mm -hmm. the Solars, and the Platinums. I was able to get each of those, his PEs. I'm just loving Kobe 6s. But when okay. it comes to, to Jay's, like, you know, some of my maybe more recent pickups that I just love that I that are just absolute must that everyone has to has to see. These two are crazy. I mean, oh my god. These right here. I mean the Craig's, Tell them what it is. Tell them what it is. These for are the podcast. Sager ones, Craig Sager. Uh, you know, rest in peace, but one of the oh, greatest to ever do it on the sidelines of the NBA for I don't know how many years, 40 years he probably worked Legendary for the NBA. Shoe, bro. But this was a shoe made for him and his family. Yeah. Um, he lost the battle with cancer. He fought the battle really well. I don't think he lost, but his time was up and uh this is just one of those legendary pieces that that uh that just reminds me of him and his passion. I think yeah. that's why I love it. He just was so passionate about what he did. And so the sneakers obviously incredible. The design is amazing. Um explain it to the people for uh on the podcast. Yeah. So so Craig Sager was known in his days for having just outlandish suits for the mm -hmm, most part. He, mm -hmm. And it didn't start early on, but later on, he would just wear some of the craziest, most colorful, loud mm -hmm. suits. And so when this was designed by the Jordan brand, they're like, let's bring in some of his, you know, let's make a tribute to him. And so they brought all these different fabrics that might have been featured on his suits over the years. And it's almost like a what the design, yeah, you know, like, like a, a what different the Sager. element. Yeah. yeah, what the Sager. So super incredible shoe, well designed in every which way imaginable. Um, and uh, one I've, of my favorites. That's the 13? 12 and a half. Oh, okay. I'm about to say, because- Were you trying to steal my shoes? No, I was just wondering, you know. <laughs> no, nah, but it's it's funny, because I never see, like, the bigger sizes, man. It'd be hard to find. Like, every time I see a pair, it's always, like, a small pair, bro. Yeah, that's why I was super- When I grateful. That's why, I'm, like, when I'm looking at those right now, I'm like, bro, you probably went through some stuff to find that pair. Because <laughs> that's the thing about him, too. He'd be having, like, some crazy stuff. His collection super low-key, which eventually we still got to do the collection video. We'd be talking about it, but we both be busy. <laughs> yeah, too busy. Too busy to- and then this one right here, I, I was going to bring, when I was playing in Baltimore, mm -hmm. Spike Lee came to a couple of games in which I pitched. Fire. And I got a chance to meet him and talk oh, to him. Oh, that's fire. He signed this baseball for me to my man, Jeremy Spike Lee. That's fire. And it was, it was amazing. So Spike's always been someone that I think, you know, growing up watching the commercials, one of the most influential man. kind of entertainers in the sneaker industry. Do you know? Do you know? I mean, Air Jordan, Air Jordan, Air Jordan. Right. So Spike's had a few J's over the years. This one is by far my favorite uh, tribute to him and um, 40 Acres when they yeah. won, when he won his Oscar. This was a shoe made for him by Jordan Brand for mm -hmm. him to wear. Um, I think this is one of the most beautifully designed shoes. Yeah, I was just about to say beautiful was the word I was you know, just thinking. There's too. a lot of gold J threes, right? You got Usher threes, yep. Drake threes, maybe a couple others. I'm not yeah. sure. But this one for me is is the cream of the crop. Colorway, color blocking. So for those that are listening as well, you got a translucent outsole, black pods, you got a black and white midsole, and then you got a gold print, the gold elephant print on the front and the back end. It's kind of like a foil gold. On the mud guard. Kind of got like this satin inner satin liner here, which is liner. ridiculous with uh, the Tinker and the Spike yeah. Lee signature yep. on the inside. And then it's like the it's like the Tinker 3 with the swoosh yep. on the side, Nike branding. And it's got like a cracked, like distressed foil type of uh, material on the eye area and on the tongue and around the collar. And you got the shiny gold. And it's a mixture of kind of textures too on it the is, eye yeah. stay areas. One is like more textured. One is more smooth. Uh, great shoe. And then... Those are like rope laces too on those ones, right? Yeah, they are rope yeah. laces. It's kind of like a flat detail. rope lace, I guess. Yeah, good call. Um, great shoe. I've seen these one time before, and it's always an amazing shoe to look at. This is a shoe that a lot of people will never see in person. Yeah, probably not. Like it's actually a great, great shoe. You got to come to the DNA show to check <laughs> it out. That's where you got to. Oh, find. what? Uh, I'm sure people are going to be asking, what is the like? like what would somebody value these shoes at? Who knows? <laughs> shoes only worth what someone's willing to pay, but. <laughs> I know what I was willing to pay. <laughs> <laughs> These shoes are definitely like figures, yeah. multiple thousands of dollars of sneakers we, we or call trades these, or in, whatever. In my world, we call these uh, nice vehicles. Yes. You can have a nice vehicle or you can have a nice pair of shoes. Right, right. 
definitely good display so you did a video like way back showing your collection like how many years ago it was like 10 years ago over 10 geez it's been forever I, that was when i lived in utah and i had the vault door mm -hmm. down in the basement everyone always asked me do i still have the vault the answer is no mm -hmm. um i wish i did right but um yeah it's been forever ago i mean so i saw that video hundreds of shoes ago if you will yeah i saw that video we never even got into the other part of like how we even know each other and everything i saw the video I reached out to you when I was young, and then I think I didn't hear back from you for a while. Then I reached out again on something else, or you might have seen something. I don't remember. It was something, but we had like messaged, and mm -hmm. we we're like classic, like sneakerheads. We're the same size. You see each other over something. You're like internet friends or something. Yeah, exactly. Like one of those type of scenarios. And then years go by, we communicate a little bit more. You know, might see an Instagram story post or something, and then we first saw each other at the Chiefs game, right? Yes, down in uh, Oakland. Yeah. So I'm going, this is like what, 2018? No, geez, well before that. This was like 2012. It was a while ago. Yeah, this was like 2013, 12, 14, that range. Something like that. So we go to the game. I'm in, like, so when you go to games, typically, uh, as if you get tickets from like a player, like you're in like the same section, like the friends and family section. So they usually put you like in the 100 section, depending on if you're away or home team. And they'll put you like close to like behind the uh, team or like in the end zone corner or something like that. So you go in there, you'll see a lot of people's aunts, cousins, uncles, friends, whoever, <laughs> right? That's just kind of how it goes. Um, so my friend played for the Chiefs. Your friend played for the Chiefs. Two different friends, two different athletes. We end up there. We're, I, I'm walking down and I just like see you and I'm like, what the, what is going on? He's like, yeah. And then like, I started tying it all back to Kansas city, different yeah. things like make sense. But yeah, that's where we had originally met. That's right. That's right. And it was like, we we're just like hitting it off at the game. We we're like talking about shoes. We're not even watching the game no more. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good time for sure. So we're doing all that. It was all good. And then, um, yeah, over the time we just kind of like started connect, started doing more stuff. And then I did I feel like I saw you somewhere else too. Like we somewhere. saw each other at the uh, Les Schwab last year. Oh yeah, like a random thing. I'm like, yeah. where did I see you? Les at? Schwab, yeah, uh, basketball tournament. Yeah, we're at the little now. basketball tournament. But yeah, it's been. Uh, it's I been... see you everywhere on Instagram, on the internet, in person. <laughs> I mean, ever since we first met, you're the mega star, right? Maybe I was a uh, somewhat of an athlete <laughs> star before. Now you're the mega star. No, I, I remember. I remember too. Like, remember when you came over here yeah. before you left on your mission? Oh yeah, like. However many years think, ago, did we do a was? podcast or were we just talking sneakers? Huh? Were we just talking sneakers? Or you just we came over. You brought like a box of shoes, and we, we were show just and tell? we were just talking yeah, shoes like for like two hours in the living room on some random stuff. Yeah, and I'm like trying to explain to my wife like who you are, who's coming over, and everything, because I'm like that was a that might have been. I think that was the first time we had definitely like been together in a place. Like on a, I guess, more intimate level that yeah. way, just like kicking it, talking kicks and stuff. And it was just like a weird moment because normally, like a lot of my other friends are like pros and stuff. I'm thinking like, I'd have known you for years. We didn't hoop or play whatever together or something. Like this dude's randomly coming over to my house. I don't know what's going on. Like <laughs> this is kind of weird, but well, at thanks the same for trusting time, me. <laughs> it was uh, it was like definitely like awkward at the beginning for me because I was like, I don't even know how to. This is gonna go. Yeah. But it was great though. Like was I was cool. like, I rock with you, bro. And now we play basketball together. Yeah, on yeah, that's my guy. <laughs> I love it. So, um, okay. You got anything else you want to tell us? No, shoot, this has been so great. Okay, I love that you invited me. I'm, I'm sitting on the same couch as legends like Aaron Cooper and Gentry Humphrey, and uh, we had Stephen Smith, D. Tolliver. Yep, you know Stephen Smith, designer Which of the Smith? Easy. Yeezys. Stephen A? No, <laughs> <laughs> yes. no for the sure. The Yeezy no, designer. Yeah, yeah. I, I interviewed him a couple weeks ago. I got I, had some, I got some good episodes coming. Well, that's why you got all these secret Yeezy samples back here. Yeah. You're not showing anybody. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> yeah, no, it's been good. And I'm excited, bro, to have y'all tell y'all stories. Like, yeah. I got to learn a lot more about you. Um, I got to learn things, too, about, like you said, to me, my biggest takeaway so far was, like, really doubling down on like how you measure success, how you have an impact on people, what your purpose is, all those things. Like that was the biggest thing yeah. from my takeaway uh, from the conversation. I'm sure everybody has their own nuggets that they might have pulled from it. Um, but we got a final round. We always do like the questions and that everybody asks me. I'm ready for so it. So I got to ask you the questions. Okay. Um, what is the most you spent on a pair of shoes? 15,000. And what was it? Hmm. 
can't disclose that. Can't disclose. Okay. Uh, I bought a pair of the the cleats that Michael Jordan wore when he was a baseball player. Oh, Signed. the original nines that he what? wore. He actually. Was it the them. one with the special diamond thing? Uh, Remember how they came? They had a one. They had a, a Jordan nine that came with a diamond, and it was like a case that goes over it. Mine doesn't have that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I have seen that. Mine doesn't have that. Okay. Either way, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, that's a great one right there. Wow. Um. Okay. How many pairs of shoes do you have in your collection? Uh, four hundred and fifty. Four fifty. Okay, that's solid. It's my, it's my, it's it's humble, yeah, humble you got some collection. Bangers you know? though. That's the thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Tell him we need to do this collection video, and tell me <laughs> to open up my schedule too, because I'll be slacking, bro. I, it's, it's like December. You don't, you don't want to get deep in there. Some real things. Some real gems are gonna. Bro, come out. we gotta you do it. it. What's what you doing in December? Who knows? Maybe Christmas. <laughs> Maybe. We're gonna go I got like some, a two-week window. We're gonna go build window. some houses down in Mexico. I do oh, that. for real? Yeah, with the family, we're taking them down to Mexico. That's dope. Gonna, How's that go? It's going well, except my thirteen-year-old doesn't think that foregoing gifts is the best idea for Christmas this year. We're right. gonna forego gifts and go build houses. That's dope. He's loving the house party. He's not liking the foregoing gifts. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "Come on, man, I need some dope." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is dope, man. That's fire. How do you guys set that up? Do you just like? Find an organization and yeah, we contact did. them. That's exactly right. We asked a number of friends who we'd seen either put pictures up or talk about it in the past. If we want to mm-hmm. do that sometimes as a family. Dope, yeah, it'll dope, be exciting. Dope, dope. We're that, really grateful. That's fire. Okay. Um, what was the last question? Oh, what uh what's your what is the greatest shoe of all time? Are you talking about a single a silhouette or what is the a greatest, colorway? What's the greatest sneaker of all time? That's what people ask me. I just ask mm-hmm. that broad question. <laughs> the greatest Jordan of all time is the Air Jordan eleven. Okay. Hands down. Okay. My f- the greatest sneaker of all time for me is the Ergo LWP. What is that? I know I should have brought it, man. Let me Ergo, look this up. Go look it up, folks. Ergo LWP, and just think one thing, baby Jordan. LWP. Ergo LWP. Yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. Ergo L. Oh. And when we do the sneaker, when we do the sneaker closet preview, whatever you call it. Hey. I will show you some stuff in the Ergo LWP that you've never seen before. Okay, customized directly for yours truly. I like it. That's amazing. Oh uh, yeah, because you had your you had a, a your own PE too with the okay. Revis. Yeah, that's fire. Okay, greatest shoe of all time for me. Dang, okay. I play basketball in those shoes. I average another 10, 15 points a game. Jump five inches higher. No way. <laughs> you know you've seen it. Huh? <laughs> Shoot the J. Okay. Um, What's that? What's that? What's the other one? There's one more. Greatest shoe. Oh, if you could have one shoe for the rest of your life, what would it be? I brought it. I brought it. If I could have one shoe the rest of my life. Oh! I got a shout out to the to the man, Justin Timberlake. Legend of Summer 3. Love it. Legend of Summer 3. The whole collection's incredible. But this bad boy right here had to hunt this one down for a minute. It's so hard to find oh, our size. So nice. Size 13. Right I here. know. Bang, 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 I'm bang, so bang. jealous. <laughs> I'm keeping this one. It's right up there with the Red October, but I think this one just because. It's, it's better. To me, it's better it's than Red October. Timberlake, too. I yeah. love Timberlake. If you know me, you know I love boy bands. I love pop music. Okay. And so when I think of uh, just what this one was. Okay, my bad. You have to explain it for the podcast, too, real quick. So. Translucent outsole. Oh, you gotta red. describe. I can't do it like you. You're you're a you're an artist. Okay, red right? translucent outsole, red midsole. You have a shinier red on the toe, more more metallic, and then on the midsole you have a red patent leather, and then on the elephant print instead of an elephant print, it's more of like a scale, snaky scale. Yeah, yeah, you have a scale, and it's a like a matte kind of like suede with a like a more metallic finish on the ends, and then on the upper you have an all red suede. You have a stingray. On the back, around the mm, collar, mm. and around the eye stay area in the middle of the foot, red suede on the tongue, embossed Jumpman, flat wax laces, and then a white premium leather uh, oh, tongue and yeah. sock liner. Crazy fire. With the suit and, and tie then, on And the... a suit and tie on the uh, insole. Is that a quick breakdown for you? It is. That sounds pretty accurate. One thing would do it for me even better is if this outsole glowed in the dark. Oh, if they would have done Red October glow in the dark yeah. outsole, that would have just topped This it whole off. set is fire. Honestly, the twos are fire too. Yeah. The twos are slept the twos on. Twos are great. But out of the whole set, this three is definitely the best Yeah, they one. made four ones, mm-hmm. a two, and a three. So mm-hmm. there's six total in the Legend of Summer series. I got all six. Oh, you the goat, bro. You got to chill, man. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate it, bro. Uh, let them know where they can find you. Where, let them know where yeah. they can find custom cleats. And then uh, we can get out of here. Absolutely. You can find me at the Real J Guts on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find custom cleats at custom cleats. Perfect. Simple enough. Easy. Come visit us. 
Think about what shoe you want to ball in. Golf is where it's at. Okay. Golf. Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh, yeah. Some, I got some mean what the KD6s and golf shoes. People really? At those mismatched uppers, you know, like that. Oh. Those are crazy. And on top of that, they kind of got a waterproof feel to them. That Kobe 6. Dude, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's perfect for golf. Oh, man. That's I still crazy. shoot 104 when I play, but man, do I look good doing <laughs> it. <laughs> that is definitely our note to get it's out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, subscribe, hit the download button, five-star reviews on all the platforms, hit the like button on YouTube. You know all the fancy things. I'm learning a little bit more about the podcast and tell people what to do now. All right, you guys, we're out. I see you. Appreciate it, bro. We'll see you. <laughs> yes, sir. Appreciate you. <laughs>